Tonight we are excited to welcome Thomas Apt, a senior research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Both in the United States and globally, he teaches, studies, and writes on the use of evidence-informed approaches to reducing gun, gang, and youth violence, among other topics. Abt is a member of the Campbell Collaboration Criminal Justice Steering Committee and the advisory board of the Police Executive Program at the University of Cambridge. Previously, Abt served as a policymaker in Barack Obama's Justice Department and worked for New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, seeing all criminal justice and homeland security agencies in the state. Today marks the launch of his new and crucial book, Bleeding Out, The Devastating Consequences of Urban Violence and a Bold New Plan for Peace in the Streets. Joining Thomas in conversation this evening is Walton Hale Hamilton Professor and founding director of the Justice Collaboratory at Yale Law School, Tracy Mears. Tracy is a nationally recognized expert on policing in, in urban communities, and her research focuses on understanding how members of the public think about their relationships with legal authorities, such as police, prosecutors, and judges. She teaches courses on criminal procedure, criminal law, and policy, and she has worked extensively with the federal government having served on the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Law and Justice and the US Department of Justice and many more that are not listed here. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Thomas, Tracy, and Bleeding Out to the Strand. I'm supposed to use this. it. There on? we go. It is? Okay. His sounds like it was on. Mine didn't. Hi, everybody. How are you? Uh, we are here to talk about Thomas's new book, Bleeding Out. And um, I'm going to ask Thomas a few questions, starting with, um, interestingly, this book is about how to address urban violence. I think it's interesting that the first conversation we're having about the book is in New York City, which is the safest big city, maybe even the safest city per capita in the country. So it might be useful to start by talking about why um, this is such a critical problem to address right now. Sure, I actually think uh, it's, a, it's a central challenge that we have uh, in terms of communicating to the public the importance of uh, addressing this issue because here in New York City and nationally, we've had two and a half decades of relatively good news in terms of uh, crime dropping. Uh, beginning in the early 90s, both here and nationally, we saw a relatively steady drop, a rel a, a, an extremely dramatic drop here in New York City and uh, we're now at rates that are you know, a fraction of what they were uh, at that time. But I think it's important to, re uh, to remember that it really depends on your frame of reference. So if you look at, the, uh, at, the, you know, at, the, at us compared to 25 years ago, we've done really well. If you look at us compared to 50 years ago, we're in exactly the same place, no progress. And if you look at us compared to other high-income nations, we have a homicide rate that is five times higher than any other high-income nation, and that's driven by a gun violence rate that's 25 times higher. So I think there's still a case to be made that this is extremely urgent, uh, and uh, and so we, and we can go into the other costs as we talk. Okay. So then, what exactly do we need to know about urban violence in order to do something about it? I think the fundamental thing uh, to appreciate about urban violence is its stickiness. Um, what I mean by its stickiness is that it is highly concentrated uh, among a select number of people, places, and behaviors. I think we, uh, I think we really stigmatize many uh, poor communities and whole classes of poor people by assuming that in a quote-unquote dangerous neighborhood, 
everyone is dangerous or every single block is dangerous. When in fact, if you live in one of those communities, you know to go down this street and not that street. And you know that even in the most dangerous communities, it's still a very small number of people who drive uh, the vast majority of shootings and killings. And so this is an extremely important point because it can give us hope. This problem is very serious, but it is surprisingly narrow. And because it's narrow, we can actually do something about it. And one of the things that the book is really trying to do is to combat some of the pessimism that you, you see about the issue of urban violence because people assume that you have to address it through root causes, that you have to address it through poverty, that you have to address it through inequality, that the first thing you have to do is get all the guns out, uh, off the street, or you have to get everyone a job. When in fact, in most cities, um, New York City is a bit larger, but in most medium to large sized cities, it's a few hundred people who you really need to engage with, and it's a few dozen hotspots. And in a smaller city, it can be a few dozen people and a half dozen hotspots. I remember when uh, we launched GIVE, the Gun Involved Violence Elimination uh, appro approach here in New York State, and we were talking about Newburgh and going into Newburgh and trying to do something to help Newburgh, which at the time was a very small uh, uh, city, but had the highest... Uh, What's the population? About 50,000. Okay. Had about the highest uh, homicide rate anywhere in the state. And I remember telling the team, I said, okay, when we do our problem analysis, you know, when that list of people comes back, it needs to be small enough so we can memorize the names because that's the level of specificity that we needed. Okay, so you've already sort of telescoped into the book because you said problem analysis, which if no one's read the book, they don't really know what you're talking about yet. Um, so what we know, so far that you think we need to know is that it's a small number of people and that it's sticky um, and that we don't have to necessarily, maybe we can talk a little bit about that, um, go for root causes in terms of addressing this before doing anything else. So anything else we need to know before figuring out what to do or before you tell us what to do, what we uh, need to do. No, we can, we can continue. Okay. All right. So um, you started out by saying, pointing out the stickiness, the small group issue. And then you said, well, you know, we don't have to address root causes, which, us, which suggests that you have a pretty clear idea about what we can do and who should be uh, leading the charge. So why don't you say something about those two things? Right, so I think the first thing is, is that when I say that we don't have to address poverty or inequality or racism or any of these structural issues to attack urban violence, I wanna make clear, I'm deeply concerned about those things. They're extremely important. I'm a committed progressive. I believe in fighting poverty. I believe in eradicating racism. I believe in equal opportunity uh, for, for everyone. But I also think that as we continue on those multi-generational struggles, there is something we can do to save lives right now, this year. And that, and that will disproportionately benefit poor people of color. And so what I, what I wanna resist is this, uh, this pessimism that until we win those long-term fights, we can do nothing. So what can we do? Right now, this year. I think that the, the key is, is that once you have identified these key people in these key places, you need, to identify, you need to create a portfolio of strategies. There's no one strategy that you can depend on to reduce urban violence, but a portfolio of strategies that are balanced. And this is a critical point. Often when we look at, uh, when we talk about urban violence, people are coming from uh, you know, they're coming from uh, pretty strong viewpoints and they often uh, sort of believe that either the solution is only law enforcement or the solution can't be law enforcement. And in fact, what the evidence shows is that there are effective law enforcement approaches to reducing violence and there are effective uh, non-law enforcement approaches to reducing violence. And in fact, no city has ever successfully 
uh, sort of significantly and sustainably reduced violence by just doing one or the other. And so that theme of balance is very important. Here in New York City, when people talk about the New York City miracle, it's often a story of policing, of early success and then overreach and consequences and those types of things. One of the things that we don't talk about in New York City is this extraordinary tapestry of community-based organizations, of alternatives to incarceration, of advocacy groups that's really not present in the same depth anywhere else in the country. And so I think it's important to know that the sort of the story of violence reduction, you know, from in the 90s, both here and around the country, is not just a story about cops. It's a story about partnerships. Okay, so balance. And by balance, you mean some combination of what um, state actors, I'll just call it state, even though we were just talking about New York City, right? So that's mm -hmm. municipal, but state government actors and, and non-government actors. And okay, what else? So you've got focus, right? you've got balance, and then the final one is fairness. Okay. Um, I think we have to recognize the moment that we're in here in the United States, and there's really a national crisis of confidence in our criminal justice system. Um, and one of the things that uh, I learned as I sort of dug into this is that that crisis is having lots of consequences, but as you know, uh, the establishment fights with advocates and back and forth, that crisis is having real impacts on poor communities of color. And what, I'm, what we find is that when in poor communities, people don't feel like the system works for them, they don't feel like it's willing or able to work for them, they feel like it abuses them, they don't use it. And when they don't use it, that means that all of the conflict resolution that the state is supposed to be there for, that you're supposed to call the police for, call 911, that all gets handled informally. And what that means is if someone beats up your cousin, you don't call the police. You call your brother, you call your other family and friends, and you go out and you handle it yourself. And that really creates these cycles of re violent re uh, retribution, which is a, a sort of consistent phenomenon that we're seeing in urban violence. This tit for tat uh, that might have begun over relatively mundane reasons, but is now a sort of serious Hatfield versus McCoy kind of uh, vendetta. And another interesting thing about this violence is that in the late 80s and early 90s, a lot of this violence uh, could be explained by competition uh, between drug dealers and competition for open air drug markets. Uh, violence was very much associated with uh, the you know, uh, crack cocaine epidemic. But as time has passed, this violence has become sort of decoupled from those traditional understandings. This is all about other types of crime, most, uh, most namely drugs. It's often not con explicitly connected to any sort of you know, explicit criminal commercial activity. And so it's a new phenomenon that we, uh, that we really need to uh, address. So in the book, you spend a lot of time actually laying out a policy case for the three factors you were just talking about. Um, there are lots of sites and evidence. Um, there's also, um, you know, peppered throughout the book, a lot of vignettes and stories. And I thought maybe it might be useful at this point, you know, before we talk a little bit more about, um, you know, the case you're making, um, for you to motivate what you are trying to point out by highlighting these three factors, by explaining or maybe summarizing um, some of the places that, or I, I'm not sure how many there are, but you know, that have done this su successfully and what that looks like. I mean, because there are some people in the room, I know some of you, um, who have a pretty good sense of, of what it looks like. But if you don't, it's a little abstract to right. say, well, balance and you know, fairness and focus. What does right. that mean exactly? So uh, I want to just make a point uh, about vignettes. There's, there's vignettes about sort of concrete examples of success and also a failure in right. the book. But there's also uh, stories about people um, who you know, have firsthand experience. And this was something that was important to me, that the book 
basically, I wanted to put the academic literature in conversation with people who had really lived this. And so I went around the country and spoke to people with firsthand experience because they're experts too. And what I wanted to do, I did some sort of tell me about your life uh, and you know, tell me, often the story was basically, tell me how you got involved in uh, violence or gangs or drugs and those things and then how you got yourself out. But I also wanted to sort of talk to them as colleagues and peers. And so a lot of the conversations were sort of me explaining what some of the research said and then saying, what do you think? What do you think? And the thing that was fascinating was I've, you know, in this relatively small sample of people, I found that, you know, the academy and the street were largely in agreement. Um, and that uh, some of the people who I spoke to uh, really provided color on some of the academic findings that I never would have understood um, before. Uh, and so that was, a, that was extremely valuable for me personally and I think it's something that's important in the book. It's not just sort of, you know, a nerdy summary <laughs> of study after study. If you haven't bought the book, don't worry. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. nerdy though, in a good way. Right, well, um, and so, but in terms of what you do or what it looks like, here's what it looks like. A good example is what's going on in Oakland right now. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Oakland has been uh, historically a, a rough town. It has high rates of uh, violence. It's also a place that has had toxic uh, police community relationships. Remember, this is the home of the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers were started in response to police violence. So this is a, you know, this is going back decades of bad, bad relationships. But what happened in, uh, in uh, Oakland is basically a core group of community members said, uh, we've had enough and we need a new strategy, something that we know will be successful. And so what was interesting about this is these community members sort of, you know, started asking experts and found a program that had been successful and was true to their values. And this is called, uh, they call it Oakland ceasefire. It's also called focused deterrence. It's also called the group violence reduction strategy. And they pushed and pushed and pushed for this strategy. Um, they initially, the city leaders initially resi uh, resisted. And once that strategy was begun, then they insisted that it was done right and done well and done consistent with their values. And so what it looks like. And done together with them. And that they yeah. were not left behind. Yeah. And which had a very positive impact and made it one of the best iterations of the strategy. So what it basically looked like is they identified not the 10,000 highest risk people, not the 1,000 highest risk people. About 400 high risk individuals who were driving most of the problem in Oakland. And they basically, through a series of small group meetings, engaged with them and talked with them. And they created a partnership, police, community members, and service providers. And that partnership engaged these uh, individuals. And they had a pretty simple message. They said, we know what you're doing. We know that you're the ones who are doing the shooting and it has to stop. If you're willing to stop, we're here to help you. If you won't stop, we're here to stop you. And you know, the police will, would, tell, would explain the, con the legal consequences of what, uh, of what would happen if they persisted in shooting. But then the community would talk about the fact that you know, you're still part of this community. We still love you. We want you back. And also, you know, mothers who had lost children would say, you know, I don't want what happened to my son to happen to you. Those were actually some of the, I mean, you know, a lot of these guys have been through a lot and it's not the first time that, you know, police officers have talked tough to them. So that doesn't always hit them. But the, when the mothers spoke, you could see this softening and this resonating. And then you have the service providers, the guys who say, if you're willing to make a change, I can help you. And the best service providers are often guys who are former offenders. And so they say, look, I've been there. 
I used to sell drugs, I used to carry guns, and I'm here now, and I'm telling you that you can make a change. And then, you've made, so you've, you know, this partnership has made basically two sets of promises. They made promises to help, and they've made promises to punish. And then you have to be good to your word. And then you have to, you have to, uh, you know, you have to act out and, and follow through on those promises. And then you repeat. And you go to the next group, and you go to the same group. You call people back, and you say, remember so-and-so? He wouldn't listen. He had to be locked up. You know so-and-so? You know, he's got a job now. And, you keep, and you, keep, you keep the conversation going. So that's a little bit about one, one, how one of these strategies works in practice. So I see the focus. I see the balance in what you just described. Where's the fairness? Well, this is, you know, this is, this is Tracy's absolute area of expertise. She's a national leader in this. So I'll, I'll start, and then you can tell me uh, whether, I have it, whether I have it right. But I think, that the, I think that the fairness part of it, the legitimacy part of it, comes first from the fact that it's not just police. Um, that it's the, the community is there and that uh, service providers are there. I think the second thing is that there is a choice being provided. There is an autonomy that's being respected. And so people are giving, and I think third, notice is being given. People are saying, this is what will happen if you do these things. Right. This is not the way we usually communicate in, in these spaces. And I think all of those things in total sort of combine for people to say, you know what, this seems like I'm getting a fair shake. This seems like a neutral process. And even if the outcomes are not what I want, maybe I want to continue shooting, right. I'll still respect this. And as the research shows, much of it that you have actually done, the more fair people perceive these processes, the more likely they are to comply with them. Right. So what did I leave out? Um, I think you got it. Okay. Um, and you also definitely get it in the, in the book. Um, I do think it's worth pointing that out, and we're only going to talk for a few more minutes because we want to leave time for, for questions for you all. Um, but the reason why I think it's interesting to highlight the fairness aspect of it is because an important issue that you deal with in, in the book is thinking about um, how addressing violence plays into um, historical racial injustice, right? Um, so, you know, you start out our conversation by saying, we can do something about violence now. Um, we don't actually have to wait until we've addressed the root causes, root causes that I think we all believe and understand to be the cause of um, historical racial injustice. Um, and we also know that there are you know, lots of critics of the criminal justice system that would have to play an important role in carrying out um, the other part of the promise, right? Um, and so I was just wondering how you address that. I mean, I know how you address it in the book, but I think it's worth fronting that for um, the conversation we're having here, for thinking about the relationship between the importance of fairness, but also acknowledging the reality of racial injustice in creating uh, the situation that we're faced with, and how that the acknowledgement or not acknowledging it can impact our ability to do something right now this year, as you put it. Right. Um, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think race is everywhere in this work, and uh, you obviously acknowledge, you obviously ignore it at your peril. Uh, in in the second chapter, I sort of trace our racial legacy and basically talk about the reason that we're here is because of the legacy. You know, uh, you know, hundreds of years of purposeful discrimination, first with slavery, but then with racially restrictive covenants, all kinds of public and private dis discrimination that basically concentrated uh, poor people of color in certain neighborhoods and then systematically disinvested from those neighborhoods. And the toxic impact of that over generations and then and also being prevented from leaving 
uh, and then adding the, the negative uh, effects of industrialization and out-migration you know, in, the, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, leaves you with uh, a situation that promotes criminality and violence. And so, I mean, I, I almost don't think it needs to be said out loud, but I will say it out loud. You know, um, no one is more inherently violent or less inherently violent than anyone else. It's based on people's circumstances. And I think, just speaking personally, I think that this is one of the reasons that I've sort of emotionally engaged with this subject for so long and worked on it uh, so hard, is because when I, you know, talk to these guys and when I work with them and uh, I really and 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 I really hear their stories, it's pretty clear to me that I would not make dramatically different choices. choices and that many people would not and that I think that and I think that that doesn't mean that people get a pass but I think it re you really it really helps you empathize if you really put yourself in someone else's shoes so that said you know firmly acknowledging the centrality of race the reality of this work is that it involves people who used to hate each other collaborating. It involves, you know, cops who have been overly, overtly racist in the past, working with ex-gang members who have, about, you know, sworn up and down that they would, you know, that they hated all cops. You know, 10, 15 years later, they're in a meeting room collaborating and working together. And that's not always an easy partnership. But it works because they want to do so. There's a higher purpose, and that's saving lives. And one of the things that I, I think is very important is that, and, and this is sort of my point about race, but about all of these other issues. And this is born of me going from city to city, meeting to meeting for years, and hearing people say, well, you know, we can't work on this until, you know, we get this job thing figured out or until we get all the guns off the street, or until you know, we solve all this racism. And all of those things are extremely important, but people are dying right now. And we can do something about it. And, I, and so that is my argument, is that if you, if you make, you know, jobs are important. If you make it all about the jobs, you will not save lives in the short term. And the same goes for any other issue, including race. Right. And the something we can do isn't, isn't, as you describe in the book, putting everybody in prison for 100 years and locking, you know, and feeding them bread and water or something, right? It's, it's not that. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think one of the important things is you need to recognize that enforcement plays a role. But that enforcement should really be a last resort and be extremely targeted. And I think one of the things that, I, one of the points that I make in the book is that if you are really conscientiously and persistently trying to help someone, when the time comes and they have rejected your help again and again and again, and they go and kill someone, the moral case for punishment has been made and the community will accept that, accept that punishment. Right. Great. So we would love to hear, I mean, I can, obviously ask Thomas lots of questions, but um, we'd love it if you all would like to engage with us here. A couple of notes before anyone asks questions. There are three things. Um, first, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself so we can build that foundation of trust before you ask a question. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if you would please keep your question in the form of a question, that is always appreciated. And if possible, do try to keep your question as succinct as you can, because uh, I'm sure we will have a lot of them tonight starting right here. When I, when I asked you to say that, I didn't recognize, I didn't realize that I would actually know most of the people in the <laughs> audience. So you can still identify yourself, but we probably know. Good evening, my name is Frank. Um, in terms of fairness, how do you um, handle that in terms of states like Louisiana that uh, use incarceration as a corporate sort of model in terms of free labor and all those other things. And even though the state is, I think, only 30% um, African-American, their incarceration is 88% African-American, and they 
you know, rent people out. So in terms of fairness, how do you deal with that, with them not like keeping up their incarceration rates? So I actually think it's uh, really, imp I think it's extremely important and I think it's important that you use Louisiana because uh, where we are using private prisons, private parole, private probation, I think it's pretty toxic. And I think it's pretty terrible. But there is this progressive narrative that private prisons are, are driving the problem all over the country. And in fact, it's you know eight or 10% of the entire system focused mostly in the South yeah. in states like Louisiana. So you have nailed that issue. <laughs> but I think sometimes people think, oh, mass incarceration is the response is the is being driven by the private prison industrial complex. But this is a real issue, and I think this is where procedural justice, which is something that Tracy specializes in, is critical because you know, we see this in the criminal justice system all over. This temptation to sort of tax people um, as they pass through the system which is ex extremely counterproductive because the vast majority of people who are passing uh, through the system are poor. And so you're, you're really just dragging them deeper into the system. It's something that uh, I think that some people know about with Ferguson, but it's really one of the more shocking aspects of Ferguson was the, the extent to which in Ferguson before the uh, incident that sort of drove all the demonstrations, that that community had basically been funding the police department and the city go government by an extremely eff aggressive effort to, you know, uh, you know, get them on tiny fees and then late fees and other things. And it wasn't just the police; it was the courts. So it's something that we have to be uh, extremely vigilant about. And you know, n you know, New York State and New York City have not been exempt from this. I mean, we've we, you know. 10, 20 years ago, we were gouging prisoners for phone call rates. You know, you know, minute, you know, prison, uh, the, you know, cost six, seven, eight dollars a minute to make a phone call. I think that we're, I think that we're making progress, but it's still a problem. Can I just follow up on that um, and ask you, Thomas, to say a little bit about some of the arguments that you make in the book too? Because what I thought was interesting that you pointed out was, you know, the lack of fairness in a, a component of the criminal justice system in Louisiana. I'm not saying that the rest of their criminal justice system <laughs> is great either. Um, but one of the things that Thomas talks about in the book is if you're going to engage in these three, in this three part approach that he describes, um, the balance is not just about what the state is doing through the criminal justice system. So you made the distinction between community organizations in New York and then you know what the city is doing. But I think you advocate actually for greater involvement of the state, whether it's the city, federal government, state government, in providing other services as well. Um, I think it might be worth saying a little bit about that. I, I think that's a... a a, a good point. Um, you know, when we think of the state, we think of law enforcement. But, you know, you need your transportation department to be very quickly, if street lights go out, to be fixing those lights. You need uh, your health and human services to be able to get the right types of treatments to the right people at the right time. Um, you need your education system to be resilient enough to deal with kids who have been traumatized and are impulsive and have anger, issue, anger issues and not to just immediately suspend them or even arrest them and send them you know, through the school to prison pipeline. So it's true that every part of the system, the government system plays, uh, plays a role. I'll leave it there because we, yeah. I, I was so long winded earlier. Right here. Hi, I'm Gene. How you doing? Um, you mentioned earlier that, like in the 90s, violent crime was, especially in the cities, was driven by drugs, the drug trade. And then the drug trade seemed to, the violence seemed to be decoupled from other criminal behavior. And I, I've seen that, and I'm sure many people in this room have, have noticed it too. But the question is, in your research, have you determined 
basic causes for violence today that are different than being, you know, uh, drug crimes. Uh, why would people be, you mentioned tit for tat, you know, you'll take care of it yourself. But, but it seems also a gang related situation where people in groups are, are going back and forth with each other for reasons that are difficult to discern. Do, uh, do you have any insight into that? I think that there was a lot of sort of loose talk uh, a few years ago about kids sort of killing each other over sneakers or over a, a slight or over these things. And there was, a, uh, there was a grain of truth to that, but it's not really uh, accurately depicting what these kids are going through. What it's more like, I mean, uh, David Kennedy, who uh, uh, pioneered the focus deterrence strategy, uh, says, you know, these kids are not evil. They're trapped. They're trapped in a circumstance. And what it is, is that often what it is, is that you, because you grow up with a certain group of people, um, and you live in a rough neighborhood where you know, the, the language of the neighborhood uh, is sometimes violence, you band together and you create bonds and associate, uh, associations. And people, all of those people are people and they have disputes. And sometimes those disputes turn violent. But because you are all um, connected to one another, their disputes become your disputes and vice versa. And even if those disputes began innocuously, once they turn violent, a beating turns to a shooting, a shooting turns to a killing, these are now very deep disputes. And often these disputes are really inherited for years, even generations. So, you know, when people talk about, like, you know, somebody getting shot over, you know, stepping on somebody's sneakers, what it's usually more about is somebody stepped on somebody's sneakers, they're from different neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods have been at war with one another for generations. They both have lost, you know, family members, friends, or these other things, and then the sneaker happened. And when you see it that way, and when you, and when you, when you also realize, Jill Leovi said this great thing when she said, you know, take a bunch of middle-class white kids, you know, uh, you know, strip them of all of their privilege, put them in a situation where law enforcement won't help them, and introduce, you know, rivalries and see what happens. You know, we think of violence as sort of unnatural, but if you really understand it, uh, you know, it's not excusable, but it is understandable. Hi, Allison. Um, you said something about the violence being, you know, concentrated within like a hundred people within the community, um, and it just, you know, it affects them. But the community around them, it also, you know, it also affects them. So, you know, I grew up in in Flatbush, Brooklyn, in the '80s during the height of the crack epidemic, and so the mantra was, you know, snitches get stitches. And so, I feel like that that resonates. So how do you, in, in your process of healing that hundred who, you know, they're doing the gun violence and doing all of that, how do you heal the community around them to, you know, be more engaged and be more active in, the, in their community? I, I think that's a, a great point and thank you for making that point because while a very small number of people might be driving the violence, this is devastating the entire community. You know, with you know, uh, you know, uh, with fear, with avoidance, with uh, significant trauma, we are learning so much about the impacts of exposure to violence and what trauma does to people over their life course. Um, you know, Patrick Sharkey uh, is a, a researcher who uh, I cite in the book basically believes, and he has good reason to believe this, that exposure to violence is the central mechanism that is keeping many poor kids poor because they can't focus in school because they're so uh, traumatized by violence, they act out these things. And then when they don't perform in school, that limits their life outcomes. And so uh, I, think that, I think that the first thing that we need to understand is uh, 
that we need more services. And this is actually something I worked at at both the federal level and the state level. Um, you may not know, but, uh, but the federal government collects billions of dollars in fines and fees for financial crimes, and it all goes into a crime victims fund. And that crime victims fund right now has about $4 billion in it. But the way that that money is allocated, um, it goes to uh, a very narrow set of victims uh, groups, uh, victim rights organizations. And it doesn't go uh, often to the most frequent victims of crime, who, which are young men of color and young people of color. And so there is this victim's money out there, this victim services money that could be paid, used for trauma and these things that isn't going to these communities. And during my time in the Obama administration and then working with Governor Cuomo, we tried to chip away at that to make that, those funds more available. But there's still a long way to go. Hi, my name is Michael. Um, you've talked about some of the, the reticence of communities to potentially want to partner with police. I wonder if you might be able to speak to the reticence of police to adopt a different kind of approach. This is decidedly not what policing has done for the better part of its history, particularly the United States. Sure, so I think that we need um, you know, the police, the police, speaking generally, have a long way to go in terms of, uh, you know, transforming themselves from sort of a warrior mentality to a guardian, guardian mentality, which is some of the nomenclature that we're, we're now using. Um, and, uh, and although we do see sort of green shoots uh, uh, here and there, what's happening in Camden, for instance, is a good example of a, a, a formerly pretty brutal police force that has really uh, turned itself around. But I, I wanna make a point about um, you know, doing the work of violence reduction, which is you don't have to wait for the entire police department to turn itself around. Uh, in fact, most of these successful operations identify a few people on both sides of the fence who are willing to change the way they do business in order to, uh, to serve a greater purpose. And so, you know, in Boston, when, uh, you know, or, you know, uh, in Boston, when uh, oper Operation Ceasefire was happening in the 90s, it's not like the Boston Police Department was this, you know, uh, uh, enlightened police force, as, as you well know. But there were a few um, strategically placed officers and detectives and sergeants who uh, were willing to change the way they do business. I think this is also true of another leading um, uh, anti-violence intervention called street outreach, uh, known, the most famous version of it is uh, cure violence. Um, you know, in cities that have street outreach, they don't need every single officer to believe in street outreach, but they need the right officers uh, to, uh, to engage. And so I think that that's Im important as well. And as with all of these other things, if you stay focused, you can make concrete uh, progress even as you do these broader reforms. There is some evidence, interestingly, though, that if you have these small pockets of people focusing on this issue and adopting the approach that you advocate in the book, um, that we have seen some departments where that kind of approach has spread to the rest of the department. I actually think Camden is a pretty good example of how that worked. I think that's true, and I think that, uh, you know, when, you know, there are also, we have to be candid, there's also lots of examples of programs working well and then coming up against the bureaucracy and getting smashed. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, we have to also be uh, realistic. But in certain cases, I mean, if you look at uh, the heavy, heavy emphasis on community policing in Boston, that's because a lot of those officers rose through the ranks and learned that the way to do business was in partnership with the community. And it's an interesting thing because Boston really doesn't do that model yeah. anymore, but the values of that model have stayed within the department.
Hi, Catherine. Um, so you've talked about police and uh, community in this model, but um, I'm wondering about the role of prosecutors and whether what you're saying about uh, police and needing only a few key people would apply to prosecutors, because it seems to me like there's a, I have a question about whether um, with the punishment aspect and the fairness question, um, you have to have all the prosecutors on board in order to have that follow through um, work the way you want it to. So I think that uh, prosecutors are an important part of this, but the, I, I, it's the same answer with regard to the police. You don't need to reform all of the prosecutors. You can have specific prosecutors who quote unquote get it assigned to these uh, uh, um, approaches. But it is a real mind change, uh, mind shift or culture shift for law enforcement that people often initially have trouble with, which is we're gonna focus on saving lives by reducing violence. We're not here to just fight crime. Right. And so that is, a, that is a challenging mind shift for uh, police to do. Many police, especially after they see the results, can do it and prosecutors can do it. But they see themselves, I mean, I'm a former prosecutor. I saw myself originally as, you know, I respond. A crime is committed, the case is brought before me. I decide, you know, uh, I decide what I think the appropriate sentence is and then I recommend that to the judge and I, and I plea bargain and, and do these other things. And I thought that if I, you know, handled each of my individual widgets appropriately, that I would make a contribution. And, you know, and I, and I think that you do in some senses. But I didn't have a broader purpose in mind. I didn't say, how is this making the community safer? And in fact, that was a, a frustration of mine, um, is that my, my colleagues and I, we did not ask ourselves sort of the broader questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that's something that you try, that I think we need to do more of. Yep. So I have two more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Shayla. I think I have an easy question. Um, so when you were doing all of your research and um, writing this book, who was your who were you like speaking to? Who do you wish that takes um, a good lesson after reading your book? Who was like your target audience? So I think I had uh, two audiences in mind. Uh, the first audience was my community. Uh, the community of people uh, who work on this issue specifically, often with very little recognition, very little support, often heavily traumatized, you know, and, and, that, and that community is, you know, uh, you know, people like Reverend Jeffrey Brown from Boston who goes to city to city trying to create police community relationships. It's, you know, uh, Deputy Chief Tingaridis in LA who you know started the community safety partnership and did that, and it's also uh, a lot of uh, the street outreach workers, the guys who, um, you know, uh, were in this life, and uh, uh, and and managed to get out of this life and want to sort of pay it back, and want to atone for some of their mistakes and want to deal with these issues, the, you know, the Ray Sorlozanos and the Eddie, Eddie Bocanegras and the Me Melvin Haywards, uh, those guys. Uh, so I wanted, I wanted to be true to them and to sort of write a book that represented and honored their, their work. Also the, the people who have lost loved ones, you know, Kim Odom lost her son uh, and, you know, and all, all of the other people who are grieving over, over these things. And then the other community that I wanted to uh, speak to uh, is really not connected to this work at all, but they should be. And that is the New York Times, New Yorker audience, the you know, affluent, privileged person who 
you know, means well, but this is just not their issue. And, you know, it's scary, it's dark, it seems like there's nothing they can do. Uh, you know, poor people of color have been working on this issue on the front lines for decades. And so they don't need to be more engaged than they are. They're fully engaged. They need some unconventional allies. They need a little support. And as I, I'm, as I, as I, the case I make in the book is that, you know, we don't need to transform politics or transform society. A few well-placed allies in these cities can make a huge difference. And so if I can, if I can convince, you know, 10, 20, 50 people in a given city that this issue is something that they should engage in and they should care about and that they should leverage their political and social and economic capital to make a difference, that can actually move things in a city. And if we can move things, then we can really save some lives. That's a really ac excellent point. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, either from the audience or from Tracy. So I really don't want to like, that was a great moment. Um, <laughs> it's a really good moment to end, but I'm going to do the law professor thing anyway, which is, um, you said at the beginning that you know there is there is are things we can do right now to do this this year. And one of the things I thought was fascinating about reading this book is you know all of the kind of wonky wonk stuff he puts in a, an appendix at the end. Um, but I think that's a that's a little bit of road mapping you know that tells us just how doable this is. So I was wondering if you wanted to either point out something in the appendix, which many people won't read, but you all will because you get the inside scoop about what you should be paying attention to or sort of one fact that might be hidden, right? If you're reading the book and you get the three points, but you know, there's, there's kind of a, a detail actually that is really important that if we understood, we really can, you know, the person reading the New Yorker can say, actually, yeah, we can do this this year right now. So what is that? Like how much this costs or how easy it is to find the resources or how easy it is to find the people to get it done or something like that. Sure. I, you know, I struggled with that yeah. uh, in terms of how much detail to put in. And, and ultimately, you know, the book is supposed to be a roadmap to actually how to do this. But some of the details I just thought were you know, too much for the, for the average reader. So if you're in this field and you actually want to know how to do this stuff, that's, the, that's in the appendix. I, I'll tell you one very concrete thing uh, about if you're going to work in a city and you want to know whether that city is ready, um, you basically need uh, three individuals. Um, and if these three individuals sort of get it and are on the program, you have a place to start, you have a place to work with. The first is the police chief. The police are not the entire solution, but they're a big part of the solution. And if you have a chief that is dead set against a partnership-oriented approach, uh, a, a dead set uh, and really only focused on zero tolerance or these other things, you cannot move forward in that city until that chief and that approach is done. The second person, and, and maybe this is even more important, is the mayor, because the police chief reports to the mayor. If you don't have a mayor who understands that you have to have a balanced approach, the mayor is only gonna look to the criminal justice side for solutions. And other parts of the, crim of, of the city system don't see this as their problem. And it's only if the mayor insists that they have an anti-violence contribution. And so the mayor holds people accountable in terms of having a balanced approach. And then the uh, final thing is you have to have someone who is uh, a, a deeply respected member of the community. Uh, and, and when I mean community, one of the impacted communities in a given city who people recognize as credible, as an authority figure in that place, who is willing to do this partnership uh, as well. If you have those three people and they see the problem the same way and they have the same basic vision of how to get to the uh, right answer, 
you can start to build, and you can build the community out from there. But if you don't have those three pieces, it's very difficult. All right, thank you so much, Thomas, Tracy, for having this conversation in our space. Let's give them a round of applause. Thomas will be staying to sign his book at this time. Uh, we do have plenty of copies for sale uh, over with my friend Jacob at the check.